the webs, the cobwebs. Eh? Yes, right. Or no. the myths, or somebody's message, debrouillé de ça. Yes, yes. Clear up the myths. To, uh, to think on your feet, mm -hmm. to... Uh, I remember as a child, if one of us said, uh, you know, you, your father or your mother said, go take care of that, go, go fix that. And you say, oh, je sais pas comment faire ça, moi. Niaiseux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nye, 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 nye. <laughs> they, they would say, débrouille-toi, yeah. which means unfog yourself. Figure it out. And the highest compliment, one of the highest compliments that could be paid to somebody was to refer to them, if it was a, a male, as a débrouillard and a, a female as débrouillarde. Débrouillard. Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. They may be part of your clan or tribe. I know in my clan, th that wasn't a particular term, but language is particular, I think, to the families, for certain families and communities that embrace certain terms and mm -hmm. um, use that. Have you noticed that in your travels? Oh, also? that's interesting. Yes, yes. Do you understand what I mean? Yeah. Um, and and I, I, there are certain expressions that, that certain people in our family used that were, I've asked other people about them and, and they've, they've never heard of it. Here's one. See if you've heard this okay. one. Ambitionne pas sur le pain béni. Um, Ambitionne pas? Ambitionne pas sur le pain béni. Entendu, so I've never heard that, but I would imagine that the pain béni is the blessed bread or the host. You're right. So don't strive to, to be greater than that. Yes, or so appreciate what you have. So, so for instance, if you were eating dinner and you had, um, you know, nice roast beef and mm. potatoes and carrots or whatever, and you said, oh, gee, you know, uh, down the street, my friend has caviar or whatever. Right. Your mother would say, ambition pas sur pain béni. This is, this is our food. This is our gifts. These are our gifts. And don't talk about what we don't have. Be appreciative of what you have. I think that's a, an integral value and also cradles within it one of the... Um, uh, realities of Franco-American culture that uh, there's a myth that the French are, you know, I don't know, more refined or sophisticated, but the Quebecois and hence the Franco-Americans were an immigrant working class culture. Yes. Agricola, a lot of farmers, many of them came from farms, came here to work in mills, so a hard working culture where folks perhaps couldn't afford. I remember cousins in Woonsocket mm -hmm. and in Pawtucket, particularly Woonsocket and Manville, Rhode Island, who um, couldn't afford meat. So when they had meat, it was a great thing, but they could make great things, uh, piccolis and relishes from the vegetables in the garden. Mm -hmm. And uh, some were pretty spicy. One was called dynamite that the aunt would make. And it was her recipe to take those vegetables and give them some kind of uh, culinary value, I suppose. No wow. But uh, these are folks that worked hard, so they needed to appreciate what they had. Mm -hmm. So I think. Th those are facts that we really need to keep communicating. So she would be referred to as a débrouillard. And débrouillard, To say. take a little bit <laughs> and do a lot with it. Do something. Because she could definitely do a lot with yes, it, right? And be right. creative, which is where the creativity uh, mm -hmm. comes through. One of the issues that I think is very interesting in, in your life is your encounter with Brother Blue, who uh, you may want to describe him in your own way for folks who don't know mm -hmm, who Brother mm -hmm, Blue is, mm -hmm. but I've always loved his. Uh, persona, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he, well, <laughs> he definitely has a. I think he's a mystic, basically. He's, he is. He, I think he, he's definitely he's a mystic, very... and he's completely committed to the power of stories to change, change the world. Mm. And the world, you know, to him can be, you know, that one kid who's standing on the street corner. Brother Blue will basically tell a story to anybody. Yeah. Uh, I met him uh, in Boston. I was teaching in Boston at Cathedral High School, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine invited me to go watch Brother Blue. And I was completely transfixed, invited him to come to the school where I was teaching at Cathedral High School, a very ethnically diverse uh, right. uh, uh, mix of, of students. And he came and the kids at first, you know, here's this guy dressed, as you know, all in blue with butterflies painted on his face. And, 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 and pins and, and butterflies. Pins and, and balloons and, and yeah. ribbons. and. He looks like he might have, you know, just come off a circus or something. But uh, within a minute after he started, he had these skeptical, smart guy, uh, inner city students from Boston completely transfixed. And I saw that and I thought, 
hmm, I'd like to do something like that. Uh, and I knew that no one can imitate Brother Blue, and I had no intention oh, no, of even doing that. Oh, no, he's original. Because he, he, <laughs> but the thing is, he's totally himself. Yeah. And what I found with, with storytelling, and probably that, that's one of the reasons I've gotten back to my Franco-American roots, is that I think in storytelling, and I, I can't say this about theater necessarily, but in storytelling, it seems to work best when you are most completely yourself, rather than putting on personas. You know, just you can you can take on personas to better tell the story, but if you start from the basis of being yourself and knowing who you are mm -hmm. and what your values are and just telling stories from that point of view. Sometimes even just telling a funny, goofy story just for the heck of it, because it's fun. You know, there were a lot of stories that, that were told around the house uh, when I was growing up that I thought were just goofy, but it was an interchange. It was a, it was a way of pe for people to be together, like playing cards or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I have found that in storytelling, uh, and I think that's one of the big things I got from Brother Blue and other people who've, whose work I've, I've really admired, uh, J. O'Callaghan, Maggie Pierce, who lives yeah. up the street here yeah, in, not far at in all. Fairhaven. Right. Yeah, these are people who know who they are so that when they, when they tell their story, it's, it rings with authenticity and a certain kind of truth, you know? And I think Blue is the absolute embodiment of that. He doesn't... I don't think he's ever had a second thought as to how people perceive him. I mean, how could, how could he do the work in the way that he does if he did have something? Right. Like Blue and, and the, the people who I think do it really well remind you that when you're telling or when you're communicating, whatever it is you want to communicate, a poem, a story, a, a play, whatever, uh, when you start from the basis of what you happen to know, what, even if you know just one truth, if you start with that and you tell your story from that, mm -hmm. that that's, that's what makes it work. And that's what makes it work for Brother Blue. I mean, he tells in, in subways. He, he stops people on the street. He, you know, and, and um, some people are put off by it. But the people who are moved are really moved by it. Right. I met him in Harvard Square. Many Harvard years Square. after first hearing him, but it was just a natural conversation, he and his mm -hmm. wife. And Ruth, uh, Ruth right. And... Um, really interesting human quality to mm -hmm. that. So that's that's really important when you you tell. And one of the questions I have for you in your telling, how has that been shaped by your travels? Because to reiterate again the journey motif and um, the song that you started with and in terms of journeying through life, mm -hmm. how have your travels affected that Franco-American core, if at all? Well, uh, I think that the ironic, uh, g to go back to uh, that other question you asked about how did I begin to value? Yes. Well, I, I realized that when I was traveling, uh, once I went to Louisiana, this is probably a good example of it. I went to Louisiana to visit an uncle of mine who was a priest and uh, who had a parish down in Louisiana. And I traveled around these little villages, especially the ones that were uh, particularly known to be heavily Cajun, mm -hmm. Acadian, Acadian, Acadian. Right. And uh, so I engaged people in, in conversation a lot. And what I loved about it was that in those instances, there were these, there was the newness and there was the oldness. There were similarities and there were differences. And I, I enjoyed both. So I, I thought that, so for me, how, what what distinguishes me as a as a person and as a as a performer? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, if in fact somebody is going to hear my stories and be uh, taken by both the similarities and the differences as I am with other people, then it has to be clear who I am. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah. So if I have a basis or, or a, a baseline of of who I am then they can hear my story about my grandfather, they can hear the story about my Uncle Joe, or they can hear any of those stories, and they say, ah, that's who he that, is. That's that guy. And I know similar, that guy, or I know, right. Exactly. That is similar to, to my experience, but in that other way, it's different. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's two ways that you can connect with a story or a person. You can connect, if you like somebody, it's usually because you have things in common with them, mm -hmm. but also you have things 
that are different, so you can learn Hopefully from them. Hopefully so, yeah, yes, so you can yes. grow. Right. So I think the more that I have traveled, the more I've, I've appreciated, it's sort of like this ping pong thing. So the, the ball goes on that side of the table, and on that side of the table, I'm, I'm looking at other people and noticing what fascinates me about them. And the ball comes back to this side, and I say, okay, what is it about me that makes me unique? Rather than, how can I be like every other performer or storyteller or singer in the world? What's the latest trend? Mm -hmm. you know? Now, you've traveled extensively. For folks that don't know, Michael has traveled to Paris, and you've taken New part Zealand. in New Zealand, Australia as well? Or no, no, New just, Zealand? just New, New Zealand and that part of the world, but taking, Italy and Taking uh, part France. in the Open Borders uh, yes, conference. Yes, yes, right and are also honored by many different organizations, the National Storytellers uh, Circle Award for Excellence, oh, yes, and yes. Uh, that was Parents' nice. Choice Gold Award, and many other, well, too many that I can't mention as a matter of fact. But in, in your travels and in, in talking to folks globally, is there anything that struck you, again, to, to um, I guess, reinforce our sense of value and pride as Franco-Americans or as Americans, is there anything that struck you in the feedback that they've given you? Oh, that's what interesting, you present? yeah. Hmm. Well, uh, I think that it's reinforced the uniqueness. I, I, uh, the times that I've been, there, there have been times when I've been invited to certain events because I'm bilingual. Yes. Okay. Uh, and other times when I'm invited just because I'm a storyteller and, and they know of me or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the times when I, I've been invited because I was bilingual, <clears throat> I would come back thinking, yes, I was right. This is unique. Yes, I was right. This, I, I was given a gift to, to have grown up in this way, and I was given a gift to have had enough encouragement to keep it up rather than have it completely... I mean, it went that way for a lot of people, that they were so completely repressed that now they can't speak French, they can barely understand it, and there's a certain regret about that. There's a, either a sh an initial shame, the woman in your story, in your play is a great example, where she yes. was ashamed and then she became yes. Uh, enlightened. <laughs> yes, yes. That's yeah. pretty typical, I think, for a lot of folks. Is that yeah, we don't want to be like that. We want to be successful Americans. And then yes. they reevaluate. And that's happening in this region. I see that happening with more of an embrace for the French Canadian or the Franco American culture. Uh -huh. and, and perhaps it's a, it's, a, it's a phase that an immigrant culture has to go through. I'm not sure. I, I mean, it I, seems I to be. Yeah. I, I, it's a phase I had to go through because I remember in my uh, teenage years and beyond, I really wasn't that interested in speaking French. I didn't want to be identified as a Canuck. And my, my mm -hmm. father, who was very staunch about deux langues, c'est deux fois mieux. Oui, c'est deux trésors. Hein? Or, or, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, deux trésors. Trésor. So two, two languages are twice as good or two treasures. Um, he would never insist that I spoke French, or that my brother spoke French. But he would speak French to, to me. And if I answered in English, he wouldn't get ticked off, but he would always make it clear what his position was. Mm -hmm. So I went, to, I went to Providence College, and at some point they gave us a, um, a test, uh, a foreign language test. And if you pass this test, you could get credits for, I understand. for free. Yeah. And I thought, what could I lose by taking the French test? Mm. I hadn't been particularly good in French in school with the punctuation and all the accents and uh, the diphthongs and all yeah, the rest yeah, of that. Accents are tough. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I took the test and I passed. And when I told my dad that this had occurred, he wasn't the type to say, I told you so. Uh, but he just kind of grinned and he kind of, c'est bon, ça? C'est bon, ça? And it was a, kind of an affirmation of his, his position. You mm -hmm. know? And, and so I put it aside, so all those years, if that hadn't happened, I don't know, I, I probably could have put it aside for a, a while. But I think that if it's in your blood and bones, and you do put it aside for whatever reasons, if you listen to those voices that say, well, your culture is, you know, it's just uh, secondary, or it's not, it's, it's uh, second class to the Parisians, or however, you know, there's all kinds of ways 
one culture can put another culture down. Yeah. Uh, if you listen to those voices and you do accede to that sort of um, suppression, I think what happens is you get to a point where you realize that was me. That was me that I threw away. That was a part of me. That was part of my spirit. And I listened to those people who, who would reduce my spirit, and now I'm impoverished because of it. You know, so for me, I, I, I mean, there's a certain defiance about it, but it's, it's less defiance than affirmation of, of, of some part of yourself that you value. Mm -hmm. And the affirmation via language or via music or via any creative means is, to me, the best way to do it. It's essential. Yes, absolutely. It's a feeling thing. You can feel it. You know, I have cousins who don't any longer speak French but they still understand. They can follow mm -hmm. a conversation, but they'll throw in their bit in English. But they know the songs. Yeah, I encounter folks like that, too, and they'll yeah. understand, I can understand everything you're saying, but they can't speak it, barely, just you know, a few phrases. But sometimes the songs the are the, song, the, the emotional, portal. Uh, yeah, the gateway. They're the portal. Mm -hmm. and I, I remember once I, uh, I was in some little town in Connecticut that had also been a mill town. Mm -hmm. And I did a, kind of a bilingual performance at a community college. And this little lady came up, and she must have been late 80s or 90s years old. And, and she came up and she said, Ça fait 50 ans. Ça fait 50 ans que j'ai pas entendu ces chansons-là. It's been 50 years yeah. I haven't heard those songs. <laughs> and she said, Je, je dois te donner un beau bec, toi, là. Oh, mon Dieu. I have to give you a big kiss. Voyons donc. <laughs> but she hadn't heard the songs in, in 50 years, yeah. but it was the songs uh, that, that kind of connected her. And, and uh, so in, in some ways, uh, there were people in Lewis and Maine, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, places like that, who may not be speaking French, but they, not only do they connect with the songs, but they identify themselves, this is happening more and more in Maine, people identify themselves as Franco-American. So you say, do you, do you speak French? I say, no, but I, I'm a Franco-American. I have a meme. Really? And I think but perhaps that, that's due to meme. Oh, I, I, I would love to think so. <laughs> but I, I really would like to remind the audience that Sunday is at Grandma's, which is Dimanche chez Meme, when you say Meme, Grandma. Meme, I mean, oui, oui. And Pepe is a wonderful cassette that um, Michael has produced. And along with, um, who's, who accompanies you here as well, a fellow? Uh, no, no, there, there, there's an accompaniment here. And, uh, there's no, there's no, the, uh, there, there's an intro. There's a s the small fiddler. fiddle yeah. intro, Freda Epstein did okay. that. She was more the producer, a oh. wonderful producer of the, of the recording, but she only did that little intro thing. And Michael's CD, Chanton Let's Sing, which is a way to introduce the music and the culture to children, but not only to children, to um, all of us, actually. And Dunanan is uh, profiled yes. here, as well as Planté d'Ishu, which is a oui. song where we learned the different parts of the body. So you can be sure. planting the ishu, the cabbage, with your elbows yes, <laughs> or yes. your knees, very exotic. Your uh, toes, yes. Different ways of planting. Savez-vous planter des choux à la mode, à la mode? Savez-vous planter des choux à la mode par chez nous? <coughs> Can you plant your cabbage so just as we do, just as we do? Can you plant your cabbage so just as we do back at home? On les plante avec nos mains à la mode, à la mode, on les plante avec nos mains, à la mode par chez nous. We can plant them with our hands, that's what we do, that's what we do. We can plant them with our hands, that's what we do back at home. Savez-vous planter des choux, à la mode, à la mode, savez-vous planter des choux, à la mode par chez nous. And the way the song was sung, you would plant the cabbage with your feet, with your knees, with your elbows. On les plante avec nos genoux, à la mode, à la mode. On les plante avec nos genoux, à la mode par chez nous. Genoux, knees, elbows, 
coudes. On les plante avec nos coudes à la mode de, à la mode. On les plante avec nos coudes à la mode de par chez nous. Savez-vous planter des choux à la mode de, à la mode. Savez-vous planter des choux à la mode de par chez nous. Then you would even get down to planting the cabbage with your nose. On les plante avec nos nez à la mode, à la mode. On les plante avec nos nez à la mode.